G'day guys! If you've played Don't Starve Together for even a handful of hours, you'll have quickly noticed that there are a lot of repetitive tasks. Many things that you'll need to do over and over again in order to make food, in order to craft things, and in order to stay alive. And initially, it's more than fine to manage these things hands-on to make sure that they're taken care of, but eventually you'll want to create systems to automate some of the tasks for you so that you'll have more time to do other, more important things. And while this game doesn't have the same kind of levels of automation you'd find in something like Oxygen Not Included, you'll find that there are still plenty of things you can set up to speed up a lot of the chores. And starting with probably the most basic automated resource generator, we have Grass Geckos. Grass is an absolutely fundamental resource and something you'll need in great quantities for the entirety of the game, especially if you plan on building a large base. So it makes sense to transplant a bunch of grass turfs close to your base for faster collection. After roughly 20 days, collecting grass from these transplanted tufts can result in half a dozen grass geckos spawning. These geckos grow a grass tail every two days and will drop the grass when startled. Not only do their tails regrow faster than the time it takes for the regular grass tuft to regrow, but the geckos don't require any maintenance and continue to grow their tails throughout the year and in any weather. So enclosing the geckos in a small pen is a really simple way of having grass all year round. Unfortunately there is a limit on the amount of geckos that can spawn in a given area, but there is a way to get around this issue. By building a dual pen with a corridor in the middle, you can separate the production of geckos from the production of grass. When new geckos spawn, you funnel them into the corridor and then into the gecko holding zone. If you don't like the idea of herding geckos, and I don't blame you, you can use an ice staff to make it easier, or even telelocate them if you're lazy and have purple gems to spare. Now that you have a bunch of geckos in a pen, you just need to make sure that they continue to drop their tails when you're not around. This can be done by putting another creature in the pen. Pigs work out okay, bunny men are better, and even Chester can sit in there and watch over the grass for you. Of course you'll still have to collect the grass for yourself, but picking off the floor is faster than picking from the tufts, and you can speed this up even more with a lazy forager if you want. Pretty quickly you'll find that you have more grass than you know what to do with, and if you ever want to halt production for a bit, you can simply take Chester out of the pen. Now, this gecko pen is not exactly reinventing the wheel, and while it's a very dependable method, there is a much faster and more effective way of gathering grass. For this, you'll need wicker bottom and a lure plant. Plant some grass or twigs in concentric squares, fertilize them, and then pop a lure plant in the middle. After a few days, eye plants will spawn and start eating the grass. When they've yoinked, all that they can yoink, Reed applied silver culture to instantly regrow all of the plants. I normally repeat this process until the grass tufts need to be fertilized, at which point I kill the lure plant, spilling all the loot onto the floor in convenient stacks for collection. And depending on how many tufts you plant, you can very easily collect hundreds of grass or twigs in hardly any time at all. There are a few downsides to this method though, Obviously, it will require a wicker if you want to regrow the plants instantly. Lure plants destroy one item every 20 seconds, so it's not really feasible to let the grass regrow naturally since you'll lose a considerable portion of the captured grass while the next batch is growing. You could replant the lure plant after every one growth, but that requires you to return to the plantation every few days. There's also the chance that grass geckos will spawn, in which case grass tufts will need to be replaced occasionally. Eye plants also don't spawn in winter and won't grow on artificial turfs or certain natural turfs like desert turf, so that's something you'll need to keep in mind depending on where you build this farm, but honestly I think it's very much worth those downsides considering how easily you can gather so much. And while grass and twigs are resources you will definitely need a lot of, I'm not sure there's anything you'll need more than logs. And there are several different ways you can use creatures to chop down trees for you, you can use pigs, merms, Maxwell's shadow loggers, as well as the reanimated skeleton, but the best way to do this, in my opinion, has still got to be with Berger. It's all pretty simple, once you've got their attention, dodge three hits and then run as fast as you can through the trees. If you use birch nut trees, you'll never have to worry about Berger getting destroyed by tree guards either. You could also use this same method to get rocks, flint, and niter from petrified trees if you have a petrified forest. Unfortunately, beggar is not always around, 
they could be taking a nap or maybe someone used them to help clear out the reed trap and now you have to wait 60 days for them to respawn. For these times, I would normally turn to using the reanimated skeleton, but since this method involves killing both the shadow chess pieces and ancient fuel weaver, I think it's a little beyond the scope of a beginner's guide. Another pretty simple automated farm to set up involves spiders and bunny men. For this you'll need to build at least 8 bunny hutches in an enclosed pen and plant a spider den in the middle. In no time you'll have an endless supply of silk and spider glands useful for crafting various things like healing selves and sewing kits. I would recommend harvesting the resources during the afternoon or night time when the bunny men are outside as they will take care of any spiders that come out of the den while you clean up. Just be careful not to pick up any meat or they'll turn on you faster than you can say unclean. The spider eggs are pretty simple to get, you just need to destroy a tier 3 spider den, but the materials for the bunny hutches are a bit more difficult to gather. Depending on how many bunny villages you have in the caves, you may be able to hammer down enough hutches to rebuild them upstairs at basically no cost, but if you're unlucky, you might need to find some other way of getting the necessary carrots and bunny puffs. Luckily, bunny men don't seem to like each other very much, and you can very easily make them fight each other by befriending one and fake attacking another. The bunny men respawn after only one day, so you can repeat this every day if you need a few extra bunny puffs or carrots to complete the build. If you find yourself considerably short, however, you may want to consider making a dedicated bunny man farm instead. And I know it's a little counterintuitive to use resources for a side project that could have gone towards the main goal, but this farm would have the added benefit of generating some spare food as well, and honestly isn't the worst farm in the world to build even without the spider farm. The structure is a little different though, and you would need to add a little protruding section to funnel and kill the bunny men, either by burning them or with Winona's catapults, depending on your preference. But bunny men and spiders aren't the only creatures you can take advantage for their food or resources. Pig farms are arguably even better sources of food, and when constructed with the full moon in mind can provide valuable resources like pigskin and moon rocks as well. Firstly, you'll need to protect the moonstone. The most common way of doing this is by building statues to block any pig intruders, but you can also use fossil fragments if you find enough of them. Then build as many pig houses as you want. Ideally, you'll want their attention to be on the enclosed area, so pop down a few pig skin or glomus goop on the inside so they gather around and continue to stay out past their bedtime. When the full moon hits, they'll all turn into pigs, and if you're after pig skin and meat, you can go ahead and kill them with catapults or with your own weapons if you don't have those. If you're more interested in moon rocks, then you'll want to place a star caller staff in the moonstone. This will start an event where waves of pigs and hounds will attempt to break the staff, but since it's already protected, you can just sit back and wait until they all turned into moon rock. Obviously, this is quite a labor intensive farm to set up, but once it's completed, you'll have as much meat, pigskin, and moon rocks as you could want. By contrast, a relatively cheap and quick automated farm to set up is one for Vault Goat Horns. For those unaware, Vault Goat Horns are necessary for the crafting of weather panes, which are invaluable for some of the tougher boss fights like the Ancient Fuel Weaver and Toadstool. The horns are also the primary ingredient in Wily's specialty dish that gives you 1.5 times damage or 2.5 against wet targets, so this is a farm that I try to get down as soon as possible. In order to build it, you'll need to cull a goat herd from 6 members down to 2. One of those two will need to be your safety goat, while the other one becomes the basis of the farm. The safety goat gets teleported to a faraway pen where it will hopefully spend the rest of its days undisturbed. The other goat you'll need to move in the dead of night into a tiny pen with an anemone inside. Don't forget to place down a lightning rod and you're all set. The goat will eventually be killed by the anemone and a new one will spawn in its place to meet the same fate. Come back after a while and you'll hopefully have some horns to collect. And if this process isn't fast enough for you, you can set up one of these little murder pens for each herd of goats in the world. There are usually two when you generate the world, but you can find more if you follow suspicious dirt piles in the springtime rain around the oasis desert area. 
I would also recommend using a lazy forager to collect the loot from the pens so you don't have to get inside once it's all been set up. And now I know that I said fighting the shadow chess pieces was probably beyond the scope of a beginner's guide but I'm going to show you not only an easy way to do this fight but how to use it to farm nightmare fuel, dark swords and knight armor. Firstly, you'll need to get your hands on the three figure sketches by carrying suspicious marble pieces to their corresponding statues and mining them on a full moon. Next, you're going to need a boat and a shitload of rocks to build statues. Make one rook statue and one bishop statue first. These will go on the land beside the boat. Then make as many knight statues as you can be bothered and these statues will go on the boat. If you run out of space, you can build another boat and fit more as well, but you shouldn't really need more than what can fit on one boat. For the next stage of this farm, you'll need to return on a new moon, but while you wait for that to come around, you'll need to craft a fire staff, a weather pane, and 40 gunpowder. When the time arrives, place the gunpowder on the edge of the land and summon the shadow pieces by hammering one of them. I would recommend fighting the bishop first and then the rook. If you have a walking cane, you should be able to kill both of those without taking any hits. After killing them, making sure not to go too far away from the knights, you should notice they have all leveled up to their third stage. Now is the time for the gunpowder. Walk over to where you've placed it and light it with a fire staff. 40 gunpowder should get the knights down to a very low amount of health and you should be able to finish them off with the weather pane. Just be careful not to get too close to them or they'll headbutt you into the afterlife but if all goes well you'll have a lot of cleaning up to do and probably more shadow atriums than you'll ever need. And the last example of farming is probably the most complicated to set up and the most beneficial to use and that is of course the Krampus farm. This borrows a little bit from a lot of the other farms that we've talked about today already. You'll need a large enclosed area with indestructible walls on the outside. You'll need catapults and a wicker. Oh, and you'll need to be on the moon. Ideally, you build this area on a peninsula of the island so that you can use the natural boundary of the ocean and you don't have to build as much yourself. Once you've set up your defenses and placed down your catapults, you're ready to start farming. Read Birds of the World quickly followed by sleepy time stories. This will summon a bunch of birds and then put them all to sleep. While they slumber, you run around and smack as many birds as you possibly can with any weapon that can kill them in one shot. I use a luxury axe for this since it has a very high durability and is very cheap to craft. The kind of birds that are summoned depends on the turf you stand on, so if you want to summon more Krampuses more quickly, you can switch this out for grass turf as red birds give more naughtiness per kill than crows. When you've killed enough birds for your naughtiness to fill up, some Krampuses will spawn outside of the enclosure. The first few that spawn may roam around picking up random objects hanging around, but pretty soon they'll become fixated on the defenses you've constructed and continue to run towards them. Keep reading more books and killing more birds until you're happy with the amount of Krampuses or run out of literature then simply turn on the catapults and hope that you get lucky. Since the chance of getting a Krampus sack is terribly low at a measly 1%, there's still a good chance you won't get one after your first try. But the benefit of this farm is that you can get much, much more than just the sack itself. You get monster meat and charcoal from the Krampuses. You can get plenty of morsels and feathers from killing the birds as well. Not to mention you can choose what kinds of feathers you want to collect. I normally need a bunch of jet feathers for making feather pencils, so I'll use normal turf for the farm, but you could even add in a scarecrow to get saffron feathers from canaries if you want to make electric darts for example. The Krampus farm also provides a great opportunity for Wartox and Wormwood to work together to generate an insane amount of living logs. Wormwood creates the logs while Wartox uses the endless bird souls to heal Wormwood back to full health. And throughout this whole process, it doesn't matter if Wartox goes insane from the extra souls or if Wickerbottom goes insane from reading books either, since sanity is inverted on the Lunar Islands. One downside of this setup is that since the whole process of farming Krampus can take a while, it is prone to hound attacks, so you'll need to keep in mind a way to mitigate that threat, either by adding in some tooth traps or bringing along Wendy with Abigail or praying that they spawn outside with the Krampuses. Either way, I think the reward is well worth the risk. 
And those are the main farms that I use when I play Don't Starve Together. They definitely speed up the collection of some foods and resources that would otherwise continue to be a laborious process throughout the game. I'd love to hear in the comments which of these setups you plan on using or if you have other farming methods that you swear by, I'd love to hear them too. If you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate if you gave it a thumbs up so it could get recommended to more people. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.